And that leads very well into our last um, intervention by um, Cecil Gatsmore. I have a very anemic bio for Cecil that doesn't do uh, what he's accomplished justice, but it will give you a flavor. Africa, uh, sorry, Cecil Gutsmore is an African Jamaican. He is a retired academic and remains a fully committed activist in the struggle for race, class, and gender liberation. Over to you, Cecil. Um, good to be with you. Um, glad to be amongst the organizers of, of this event. Um, hesitant, even fearful, to follow some of the contributors <laughs> we've already had, especially uh, Professor Nahusi, who is a genuine historian of, of Guyana. I have his massive book, and no doubt there are others, on, on the, um, the, the subject. Um, having said that, uh, it's clear to me, as it will be to everybody else, that Walter Rodney did not lead a successful revolution. And yet it is important to recognize him as an outstanding 20th century revolutionary on the basis of his revolutionary Pan-Africanist practice. Uh, through that practice, Rodney contributed fundamentally to the theoretical and practical development of Marxism and nationalism, the specific form of nationalism being Pan-Africanism. And these, those two are indisputably the two great, differently informed and related revolutionary movements of the 20th and perhaps the 21st century. Um, the, 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 the latter is to be seen. So my focus here is on the truth of the claim that I just made that Walter is a significant revolutionary um, as it applies to the final period of his tragically shortened life to the last six years between 74 and 80, uh, spent in his birthplace, then and still called the Cooperative Republic of Guyana. And we're gonna to refer to it as Guyana um, after this and as everybody else has done so far, where Rodney bravely and brilliantly pursued the rich practice that is the basis of my claim just given about the need for us to recognize him as one of the significant revolutionaries of the 20th century. Um, as should be well known, capitalism, in, in, capitalism imperialism in its neocolonial form, then run by its agents, that is to say Forbes Burnham, his clique and his close supporters in Guyana, attempted ultimately terminally to prevent Rodney spending those years either at all or in any politically effective way in the country of his birth. They killed him when their multi-layered effort failed. Despite the efforts of that neocolonial clique and its state, Walter Rodney produced Guyanese historical political economy of the highest order after being deprived, as we've already been told, by Burnham of his chair in history in the University of Guyana. He thereafter, 1974, engaged unflinching, unflinchingly against bourgeois and petty bourgeois power and class positions however these manifested, and specifically in, in Guyana, as economic exploitation of the, of the, the Guyanese masses, uh, brutal state power, and, in, and some very shameless ideological forms of oppression. The first of these is visible in the fact that Burnham State, Burnham State emasculated labor organizations and overtly and covertly fought the Guyanese working class over the most basic of its rights and its economic demands. The point has already been made uh, in earlier presentation. What I call ruthless ideological forms are most, most relevantly masquerade as academic 
socio-historical studies of Guyana. And I'm going to talk briefly about that, more about that later. And also it uh, manifests as a kind of backward form of African nationalism. Now, the latter, that is to say, this backward African nationalism construed South Asians or Indo Guyanese into the principal enemy of African Guyanese and made capturing and holding Guyanese state power allegedly against Indo Guyanese, but actually objectively for imperialism as the only legitimate political task of serious African Guyanese. On the basis of this narrow race nationalism, some found it possible, and I heard this personally, to say Walter Rodney does not understand race. I heard those words in an organization in London where I regularly delivered African polit political history. And after Walter came in one of the weeks when I wasn't speaking and delivered on Guyana, one of the leaders of that organization said to me, maybe in the Wednesday of the following week, Rodney does not understand race. Now, um, sorry, something's happened to my text here. So we have Walter Rodney, returning to Guyana, and he has to cope with a very specific situation, which it matters that we understand. It matters that we understand the nature of the moment. It matters that we understand that a, a fully entrenched near colony, willing to use ideology to the max, but also willing to use physical brutality to the max and ideology included mockery of Walter Rodney, which didn't end at his death. We happen to know that when they killed him and they, the people who did it obviously had pre-knowledge, so they had prepared, including preparing ideological material mocking Walter. Their plan to some extent failed. The bomb exploded and killed him, but he had instructions as to how to hold it. And it is fortunate that even though it killed him, the, 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 the explosion didn't project upwards in a way that destroyed his face. And so all of the Burnham's regime's propaganda, mocking propaganda, related to an unidentified miscreant who'd blown himself up close to a prison in, 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 in Guyana. Now, they didn't drop that ideological, mocking, shameless thrust, even though his brother, who was meant also to be killed, was sitting next to him and survived. Incidentally, as we've already been told, they charged the brother with complicity in, 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 in the murder. But it matters that our comrade sister Andaye went to the scene and recognized him immediately. So his family and everybody knew that Walter Rodney had been killed. The mockery of that wicked regime extended to maintaining the myth that some unidentified person had been killed and they held on to his body without refrigeration until decay set in. And Walter's body was only attended to by an undertaker, I have this from his wife, because of respect for him and the family. There's an irony in the story. Burnham had a plan to have himself preserved and exhibited in a mausoleum. The plan involved taking his body to uh, the Soviet Union, where they are very good at these things. When his body got there, it had not been properly stored or shipped. And so the Russians had to tell the Guyanese, we cannot embalm this body for you. And the rest is history. Burnham 
does not lay in a mausoleum for exactly the reason that he, he, the way he treated Walter's body. So, mockery, but excess brutality was a characteristic of that state. Um, it matters that their brutality, their mockery, included depriving Rodney's organization of the main means of communication in this era, which is printing. They stopped printing machinery, which was bought, shipped in from Trinidad, confiscated. And you can read all about that and more in the interview that Rodney did in 76 with Colin Prescott. It appears in the pages of, um, of, of, of Race and Class. That regime was determined by terror. We saw a film earlier of terror in the time. This is another time of terror, the late 70s in, in Guyana, when that regime imported um, a body called the House of Israel, who were thugs, African-American thugs, imported in, into Guyana to do the kind of work that Eric Geary's mongoose gang in Grenada and uh, Papa Doc's Tonto Makut did in Haiti. These people destroyed meetings, beat up individuals on their own, and beat up uh, people assembled in open public political meetings, terrorism. And in the end, it extended to killing Walter Rodney in the circumstances where the, those who carried it out and organized it had a plan for communicating around it, which I partially dis described. Now, Walter, despite all of that, succeeded in producing a body of work which is theoretically exemplary. He succeeded in producing a body of work which embraced the popular and the highly theoretical political economic history of the, of, of the terrain. Uh, it appears in all kinds of places. Incidentally, there is a very good biography of Walter by Professor Rupert Lewis, which anybody who even begins to want to understand Walter Rodney could benefit from sitting down and reading. In the bibliography pages, the publications that Walter produced during the six years of his life in, in, in Guyana are listed there. They are very impressive indeed. The most impressive of these is the book already mentioned, his historic, his history of the Guyanese working people. And it's a very short period. No doubt he would have given us um, volumes prior to that and volumes after that and other volumes on that post-emancipation period. Incidentally, the book was left unfinished and Comrade Sister and I actually um, tidied it up for, 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 for publication. Now, I said that he, he did great political work popularly and also seriously theoretical academic work. The popular work includes the children's books that have already been mentioned, but his speeches, doc, um, speeches that became publications, including a very important one, I think it's called um, People's, People's uh, No Democracy, right? I, I know I've been told that I have two minutes. I take a little bit longer than that, but not much longer than that. Yeah. Now, um, why is his major book that came out the year after he died? Yeah, thank you. People's Power, uh, <laughs> et cetera, that, that one. Very, very important, popular work. Now, why is his book on the Guyanese working class, peasantry, call them what you will, um, agro-proletarian, call them what you will. There's lots of terminology available, some of which was developed before uh, Rodney did, did his work for describing um, the class articulation in our um, regional uh, societies. Now, there is a great deal in that book. What is important for me is the way in which he challenged the existing orthodox 
orthodoxy around relations between the Indian section of the Guy of Guyanese working people and the African section of Guyanese working people. Obviously, the former predated the obviously the latter predated the former. The Africans got there first. We know. We know, and it's already been mentioned, why the Indians were brought in uh, to facilitate cheap labor uh, in order to undermine uh, the modes of struggle of the pre-existing population. Uh, that was a basis for disagreement, disharmony, undoubtedly, between the two communities, and there was some of it. What the uh, orthodoxy that Rodney challenged on that matter was that because of how the Indians were br brought in and because colonialism promoted uh, the racial divide, that there was a primordial, that's the word in the scholarship, hatred between Indians and Africans in Guyana, and that what happened in the 60s and in the 50s and 60s, um, violence between the two groups, um, was just the culmination of a pattern of violence that, right, now Walter said that isn't true. And he used key concepts. He said that in order for there to be violence between groups, uh, now it admittedly can be caused by enough things, but importantly, you have to have a genuine antagonistic contradiction between groups. And if you don't have it, and that primarily arises from exploitation, relations of exploitation, such relations of exploitation did not exist between Indo-Guyanese and Afro-Guyanese in the post-emancipation period. And Walter did more than that. He said that if no antagonistic contradiction existed, then you will not find evidence for the claim that's being made, which is that violence had been a key characteristic of that relationship in the post-emancipation period. And what you do, and what he did, and he's immensely good at it, was go back to the historical record and search and find the evidence. And what the evidence showed, and nobody has disputed it since, is that the violence between Indians and Africans in Guyana in the whole of the post-emancipation period was the word he uses, piddling, very small, <laughs> it's in the book, very small instances, some of which can be analyzed, and he does this, leading to conclusions that it's not really about conflicting ethnicity at all. It's actually about um, power positions, the way in which, for example, um, Indians got appointed to police to police um, African villages or Africans got in, appointed to police Indian villages and so on and a whole heap of other stuff. Uh, and he says, and, and the, the evidence is there, that when you see conflict, yeah, I'm, I'm now, <laughs> when you see conflict between uh, groups, you really have to go and analyze it. And, and because he didn't just read the archival material, but looked at then current historical scholarship, Walter talks in his book about um, inter violence within the working class in Britain in the 19th century and explains that and says, right, these are two working class groups, there's violence between them, you have to explain it. And you can't explain it in terms of race. And the same applies frequently in, 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 in Guyana. Now, the effect of what Walter did was to provide a basis for the mode of organization that he entered into the, the um, WPA, um, which was um, inter-ethnic. Um, there's much more to, 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 to Walter's book, the two concepts of race, the fact that the dominant concept of race applies to white power versus um, non-white blacks um, in, 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 uh, in, in Guyana. Um, it matters that in the Cold War, and in therefore the 50s and 60s, imperialism systematically promoted uh, race division, race conflict, if you will, racial interest in Guyana. And Walter's work provides the basis for 
holding and understanding and organizing on the basis that the enemy in Guyana, the Indian's enemy isn't African and that the African's enemy isn't Indians, but the system that has managed, despite the er their early more or less cordial relations, to have them at each other's throats, and that if Guyana is to, pro to, to, to progress and not make the kind of mistake that the ruling circle is presently making, which is to ignore Walter's work on um, foreign direct capital investment, if they'd paid even a moment heed to that work. He has an important um, lecture which he gave in 1971 in the United States, which turns up in a, in a journal called Uf Ufahamu. And in that, he makes it clear that foreign capital of that kind is the basis on which capitalism gets hold of our resources, uh, uses those resources to pay for the investment and ends up owning without actually putting anything because it gets recycled via amortization and taxation and, and, and all of that back into the country. Exactly what is happening in Guyana now, but in a very horrendous and dangerous, threatening way. Um, it is a pity, that, therefore, that we're only just getting to the business of reading Walter's work because it would be not just transformational, but protective of our interests because we don't understand our interests better than we do. Thank you.